Lots of focus on primary schools going back yesterday. A majority of schools did reopen. Uh, also a lot of focus on whether or not the two metre rule uh, is, uh, is necessary and, and should it be kept in place. Let's talk about all of that with Neil Dixon. He's Chief Executive of the NHS Confederation joins us once again. Good morning to you, Neil. Good morning. Um, let, let's talk first of all about primary schools returning. We know, you know, around the world and certainly around Europe, uh, countries that have had a similar sort of experience with coronavirus uh, here as we've had um, have uh, returned their children to school very successfully. Um, it does appear that the majority of schools did reopen primary schools to uh, reception year one, year six, or some of those those years yesterday. Others planning to reopen this week, but there seems to be an agreement that actually it's not possible uh, for all primary school pupils to return, and particularly because of this need for social distancing and particularly because this two metre rule. Do you think that the two metre rule is, is almost the biggest issue right now in terms of you know, people feeling that that is what's vital in keeping us safe and yet it's also what's preventing schools coming back, preventing lots of workplaces coming back, shops reopening and indeed pubs and restaurants reopening? I don't think people have thought much about the two metre rule and whether if you reduced it to one metre it would be better because of course during lockdown if it was a question of how far you walked past somebody in the road or the street then two metres seems absolutely fine. I think it's when you are starting to push people into more confined spaces and the number of people for example you can get into an office or the number of children you can get into a class then obviously the question of the distance of whether it's one or two meters starts to <coughs> starts to make a, a much more significant difference as far as we can see and i'm not a scientist but uh, yeah. as far as we can see that the evidence around one and two meters it does seem to be shifting slightly i think the government should be very cautious uh, as always about rushing forward, I think they, I understand they are doing a review at the moment of the one to two metre uh, rule and uh, where, where is the right, the right point for it. We hope very much that they won't make a decision which is, in a sense, oh, well, it, it might be all right. It needs to be absolutely right. So I think it's the cautionary principle that one would want to see going forward, even if that means in some ways it is more difficult, for example, to get more children back to school or get us into some other areas that we would like to. On the other hand, if the science does show it, we shouldn't stick with something that is just making life more difficult because it is this constant battle, isn't it, between the cost yeah. of lockdown, not just financial, but all those other costs, the social costs, the effect on vulnerable children of not having school, all those factors need to be taken into account as well. Well, indeed, and again, it, it will be the, the NHS that, that bears the brunt if these decisions are wrong. Um, there's been a lot of concern, though, that about people's, people returning to school um, and, and people returning to their workplaces uh, and, and you know, school. Um, uh, we've seen you know, re big retailers like IKEA reopening. Again, there's one place you definitely can, uh, I think, maintain two metre distance in, the, in IKEA, those huge, huge warehouses, much easier than in most corner stores, I would have thought. Um, but a lot of this was supposed to be happening after we had tests and trace in place and it's something I put to cabinet ministers again and again and again um, with the best will in the world I always say to them and I really do mean that because I do think the vast majority of people in this country want the government to do well don't care how they voted don't care if they like Boris or, or like Brexit or any of that stuff you know, it is in all of our interests the whole government handles this pandemic well and, and there are understandable reasons why certain things aren't done and are done and you know you, you live with the consequences of 20 years of spending less on your NHS than say Germany did and we started from where we started can you see any good reason why the test and trace system has not been up and running for weeks now in time so that it was all working very, very well before we started easing out of lockdown. Have you got any explanation for why that has happened or not happened? I, I, well, I, I can speculate rather than real knowledge, to be honest. But first of all, the government at the point where it stopped contact tracing at the beginning of the epidemic, there was frankly very limited testing at that point. So their concentration was to switch and, of course, to try and build up testing, but also to uh, concentrate that testing on, on for example, on hospital, on hospital patients and, and NHS staff, because that was the big fear of the big surge coming in that area and making sure that they could segregate COVID patients from non-COVID patients. And that made sense at that time. What I'm not sure happened at that time was the beginning of, even if we haven't got the testing yet now in place, are we going to work with local directors of public health? Are we, how are we going to set up this national system and how is that system 
going to work. And you could do planning even if at that point you didn't have the, the necessary testing. And in a way, you didn't need to do the testing if everybody was locked up because yes. at that point you didn't necessarily need to Well, that's to it. At ten, we've been in lockdown for, for 10 weeks. The, the, on day one of the first week, we knew that we needed to have test and trace in place yeah. for us to come out of lockdown. I agree with that. And, and the thing we've certainly gone on about is that really until very late, they didn't engage effectively with the local authorities and the directors of public health. That is now happening. And the directors of public health, who are very cautious about the ease of lockdown, are nevertheless saying, yes, we are now working well with the test and trace system. It's We're trying to set up local action plans at great speed so they recognise that, you know, this is being done late on in the day and obviously linking those local action plans into what needs to happen nationally. The the other thing, I guess, is just the the government seem reasonably confident at this point that test and trace is, is working. Of course, it does depend on the number of new cases that there are and whether they can keep on top of them and do the tracing around them. I suspect at the moment, and I gather there are, there were reports yesterday, certainly, of, of quite a lot of contact tracers who are not being used. And I, I don't know that that is necessarily a cause of concern. The point is, are the ones who are needed being used to follow yes. up those cases where cases occur? And are we able very quickly to identify an individual and then the people they've had contact with? And then the big question, big, big question, is their compliance? Are people willing to isolate themselves because they've been in contact with someone and it's the same question as people being sensible about the measures from june the first and you know we're very cautious about all this the r rate is still you know it's not not as low obviously not as low as one would wish it but the key thing is will people actually be sensible will they follow the guidance to the letter and if they do then obviously the risk of the r rate going up is is considerably less um, but there is a lot of good news. I mean, the lowest death toll since lockdown, 111 yesterday. Again, 111 people who've lost uh, their lives and 111 grieving families. But, you know, a lot better than some of those horrific figures we had, which were creeping towards 1,000 a day. Uh, 39,000 confirmed COVID deaths. So obviously, there were more excess deaths. But more than half of hospital trusts in England, those that, that you would represent, have reported no deaths in the last 24 hours. No, it is, it is good. And the government's correct to say, you know, we've got lowest number of admissions, lowest number of people in the hospital, lowest number of deaths. All those are, are good and they're going, in a sense, in the right direction. But, you know, those who are sort of <laughs> saying, well, be careful, be careful, are, are correct in, in the sense of, you know, all of us are working in uncharted territory. We're not quite sure what might happen. And, of course, if the R rate starts to go up again, the question is how quickly can you get it down? And if you try and reimpose measures you've relieved, is that going to be more difficult and people are not going to be compliant uh, in a way that they were the first time round? So there are big uncertainties ahead. But on the other hand, I don't think we should be entirely gloomy about this. And, of course, we, as you say, we all desperately want test and trace to work as indeed the NHS has effectively worked and we also want to get the NHS back on its feet again and that is going to be an enormous challenge. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Very much appreciate you joining us as always, Neil Dixon, Chief Secretary of the NHS Confederation. It's uh, 8.17. Up next we're going to be talking about those US protests and also about uh, MPs returning to Parliament. Oh yeah, and can you get a summer holiday uh, this uh, this uh, July or August as uh, the Prime Minister has been urged to scrap that 14-day quarantine plan that's being introduced to Parliament only today. You are listening to The Breakfast Show on Talk Radio.